Uh, I'm going to introduce Erin. So Erin King is the events coordinator of the Center for Social Innovation. Uh, she has three plus years of working at CSI in events. Uh, some of the events that she's run are Six Degrees of Social Innovation, Turn Off Toronto, Surfest slash Food Fight, Immigration Storytelling Event, and Pop Bubble Market. All right. So help me in welcoming Erin. While that happens, thanks guys for coming today and thank you to TechSoup Canada for organizing. So I will be speaking to you today about event management for nonprofits and for everybody else. I'll be taking you through a short presentation, about half an hour, and equipping you with three of the key resources I use when I'm planning the events for CSI. So, thank you, perfect, okay. So um, I didn't want to hand out the resources at the beginning of the event, but they'll be available for you at the door on your way out. So I will be sharing with you my secret for hosting great events. And I'm sure there's many secrets out there, um, but what I'll be showing you is, there we go. What I'll be showing you is a little more process oriented. So I will be touching on a bit of the tech tools that I use uh, to help the process, because as we all know, technology supports process. So um, if you have any questions, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, and if you have any specific questions about certain event tools that you would like to ask me after, um, no problem, I will answer it, and if I have not used it, I will be very honest and tell you. Okay, so rewind for a second. Who am I? As Yumi mentioned, I'm Erin, and I work for the Center for Social Innovation, where we're actually all gathered here today. We're a co-working space, we're a community, and we're a launch pad for people who are working to put the people and planet before profit. So I manage our events business. What that means is I'm not only leading on the events that CSI hosts, but I'm working with hundreds of event organizers across the city in, in the events that they're hosting in our venues. So this ranges from stuff like panel discussions, holiday parties, performances, and pop-up markets. In my spare time, I actually organize storytelling events with a few other individuals that I know. And in my teens, I worked at almost 100 special events, corporate events, and weddings. And what all of this has led me to realize is that events are so much more than just a gathering of people. Events tell the story of your work and your brand to everyone out there. So not only are events telling the story of what you and your business are about, but they're also engaging you people. Maybe people didn't come to your event, but they heard about it. It's in their mind. They're going to wonder how it went and maybe wish that they were there. They're going to elevate the conversation around the issues that you are passionate about. It's no longer, oh, okay, here we have a problem and now we have to fix it. It's okay, active participation. I'm going to go to this place to be with people and talk about this thing and come up with solutions, if that's what you're looking for. But events also enable opportunities for collaboration. I never would have organized a storytelling event if I didn't meet my writing group at a social that I was networking at. All this to say, a successful event will lay down a narrative for meaningful action. And whether this means meeting up with your family and friends to form deeper bonds, or influencing a policymaker uh, to pass a bill that's really important for the homeless population, it's laying down a narrative towards meaningful action. Events give people a reason to believe. And here's the biggest lesson that I learned from planning events. The people don't just show up for your snack table. People show up for your vision. And this is so important. Welcome. Thank you. So in a popular TED talk, Seth Godin speaks about how ideas might spread into a world that is saturated by ideas. And he narrows it down to this. Is it remarkable? Is it something worth making a remark about? Now, remarkable ideas, he says, spread through the world because it's different and people pay attention. It captures them. Many people have been to an event. They've been to a fundraiser. They've been to a conference. They've been to a social. What is going to make your event different? This is key. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, what can I change? We have this monthly event. 
How often can I really change the bar, or the music, or the programming? But it's not about the stuff of your event. It's important to realize that the one remarkable thing that you do have control over is the energy. Now sometimes you walk into an event and the energy is electrifying. You could be drop dead exhausted, but as soon as you walk in the room, you're woken up. People are there, they're engaged, they're sharing ideas, and somehow you know that you're supposed to be there. So we're going to revisit this idea of energy and purpose later. Now, when people think of CSI, they don't think of you know, our strategic vision or how many members we have right now. They remember that really cool talk they came to about sustainable architecture. Or they remember that networking event where they met their business partner. So your events comprise the mental construction of how people see you as an advocacy group, or as an international development agency, or as a service provider. The events you host are the stories that you're telling to the world. Now this is why videos, for example, are so important with crowdfunding campaigns. Those are the ideas behind the product that are enabling you to be involved and invest in this project or this idea that you want to have whatever small part in that you can. So through the lens of this idea, events as storytelling, I'm going to equip you with some of the tools and strategies that you need to host a successful event. I'm going to share some tips throughout the presentation. And we're going to collectively make sure that the events that you're hosting are actually doing what you're wanting them to do. Events take a lot of work, and you want to make sure that there's purpose behind that. So how are we going to tell your story? We all learned this in grade school. The five essential elements to a story. I could probably name them without looking at my paper even. They are the background. They're the rising action. They're the climax, the falling action, and the conclusion, the denouement. These elements should be applied to how you plan for, execute, and reflect on your event. Now before I take you through all of these elements and get into the nitty gritty, I want to establish one guiding principle for us for the next half an hour or so. I want you to consider your character. And by your character, I mean your guest. This is our character for the evening. Morgan. We are always going to keep in mind what Morgan wants to see, feel, hear, and remember when he, when he leaves the event. We want to remember why you asked them here and why they might even be giving us money to be there. And we want to remember what we want to give to them and what we want to take back. Remember that without the guests, there is no event. So let's see how important Morgan is in actually planning the process and not the event itself. I'm sure this is familiar to you all. It is uh, our five elements on something that I was told in grade two is called a story mountain. So the first of the uh, story elements is the background. And the background typically in literature just means the introduction. You're setting the scene, you're introducing your character, and you're building up the basis on which your story is going to be based. But for you, the background is going to be your event design. Now, an event design is a summary of all of the components of your event. There's nothing more important than the question why when you're starting to plan your event. Are you asking Morgan to come so that you can uh, convince him to be a stakeholder? Or are you trying to sell him a product? Or are you celebrating a milestone? Remember the why from the very beginning that you're planning. So an event design includes most of these elements for any given event. We're going to go through the framing and the hard details. So what is it, where is it, when. The agenda and the programming. What's the agenda for the guests and also the itinerary for you and your planning team. That's going to be very different from what you're telling to the public. The programming refers to the content. Are you going to have a performer? Are you going to have a musician? Are you going to have a silent auction? These all comprise the components of your event and are eventually going to inform how you set out action items for your team to do. Communications means things like programming and marketing, which also entails a whole subset of tasks like developing a graphic, getting it printed, getting it you know, live on the site. Your venue, so you want to consider your layout and your decor and the feel that you want your event to give. 
food and beverage, if you have it, and your budget, which is going to enable you to execute all of these things. Now, developing an event design is not only going to uh, inform the steps that your team takes, but also the public what your event is going to be. So considering Morgan again, let's frame an event for the public and then see how that's going to impact our critical paths. So we're inviting Morgan to this event. Star Inc. is inviting Morgan to their 10th annual Stardust Ball fundraiser. And we're inviting Morgan so that he can support millions of young stars in their early childhood development. Right away, we've told Morgan why he needs to be here at this event. We've explained where the tickets are, what to expect at the event, and when and where it's going to be. Perfect. So now we can begin laying down the bricks and mortar that will make up your event, which will be reflected in your critical paths. So one of the resources I'll be giving you at the end of this talk is going to be a template on how to create an event design for your team, and also a template on critical paths, so you can use that as your guiding document when you're planning. <coughs> All right, so to <coughs> plan out these specific action items for your event, we're going to have to be the Morgan. Now what do I mean by that? We want to put ourselves into Morgan's shoes at all times because Morgan is our ideal guest. Morgan is that funder who's going to secure this project for us. Or Morgan is that person who's going to go out into the community, tell all their friends, and then get more people on board with your project. Morgan is key to your entire event. When Morgan walks through the venue, what, is, what are they gonna see first? Are they seeing a sign telling them that they're in the right place? Are they gonna see a bar? What are they gonna see? Walk through the venue as if you were the guest and think of all the things that you would need if you were there, if you were arriving for an event. When you came in today, maybe you asked the welcome desk where this event was and then you saw a banner. That's good wayfinding. Just consider how hidden your venue is from the street, etc. Maybe Morgan wants a reminder a few days before he's coming with instructions on how to reach the venue. Or maybe Morgan wants a drink as soon as they come. Is it obvious whether it's a cash bar or whether they have to go get drink tickets? Or is it obvious that what is going to be served on the bar without Morgan having to ask the bartender if the bartender is too busy? Think about what you need when you're at the bar. Where's the food? Can you see the food? Is the food drawing your guests to where you want your guests to be? What about the bathroom? Where are they putting their coats? Think about all of these things once you're building out the action items for your team. Think about what you'd expect from the environment around you and the people that you're interacting with. And when in doubt, bring it back to the character. So let's say you're trying to figure out how much alcohol to get. Well, if you're hosting a one or two hour networking social, Morgan's probably gonna have like two drinks. <coughs> if you're holding a five hour social, Morgan's probably gonna drink a little more. So consider that when you're planning out the actual hard logistics of what you're getting. Remember that in a standard bottle of wine, it usually serves about three to five glasses, depending on how small or large your glass is. Now, flow of the event is also insanely key. When Morgan walks in and he sees a giant empty space, how's he gonna feel? Nobody wants to stand in a giant empty room by themselves. So cocktail tables and couches can help break up the room and make people feel more comfortable going into the room. Often, the problem with an event is that everyone's congregated at the, at the front. That's where the food is. That's where the bar is. Everyone is there, and then you have this whole big space that you could be using. It feels cramped, it feels hot. Consider the flow. This is especially important with uh, theater setup, too. So as you notice, we have to bring in more chairs. And Morgans will always sit in the back of the theater seating before they choose the front, always. A couple people might come to the front, sir. But most people will go to the back. So maybe you're keeping some extra chairs on hand so you can fill it up and you're not looking like you have an empty theater or you're not doing that shuffle where people are kind of coming into the front and you know finding seats. You're doing it from the back. So consider that from the very beginning. When it comes to food, putting, it, putting a table by the wall will encourage less people to congregate. Maybe this is important if you have a small venue and you don't want a lot of people at the food all at once. Or maybe you want to pull the food a little bit away from the table, or from the wall, so that more people can go around it. Or maybe you want to put the food all around the room and use it to draw people to where you want to go. 
you have a silent auction, put some cheese beside it. If you have some info panels, put some freaking wine beside that. People will go there, and when they're standing there wondering, oh, what do I do? They will read your info session. They will look at your auction item. That's how you draw people. People invariably congregate towards two things, guys. Two. This is all you need to know for events. Chairs and cheese. Chairs and cheese. That's where people go. If you want someone to go somewhere, stick a couch with some gouda, you're good. <laughs> now, never forget charm either. Don't ever underestimate the power of a candle in a glass with some twine <laughs> or some twinkle lights. Just think back to events that you've gone to that have taken away your breath and use that as inspiration for your events. This is very different from something like, let's say, Eventbrite. Eventbrite is an online tool. It's very functional. You need it to host your event. But these are the things that people most often overlook. And even if it's something really simple, like at your tiny workshop where you don't need candles, maybe it's a small illustration on a chalkboard. You know, Maybe it's putting out masking tape with markers so people can put their name on their water glass. Just something that's creative. Okay. So now we've thought through a little bit of what Morgan's experience should be like. Now we're going to translate this into actual actionable items for you and your team to execute on. So this is the event design. Just refresh your memory of it. Okay. First and foremost, there is nothing more important than your team. Nothing. If it's a really small event, maybe you don't have a team, but the reality is there are people supporting you, and if you can't see that, then you gotta do some reflecting. Because people, even if it's a one-woman show, someone is helping you out in some small way. And to be an effective leader, you have to recognize that. So it's very important to have an in-person meeting from the get-go with all of your teammates. Even if it's impossible to meet all together for the next three months, meet that one time. Bringing someone in virtually is okay if it's the only way that you can achieve that, but it is so important to get everybody into a room together because it establishes a common vision and it establishes a clear direction. And not only that, but most importantly, and this will carry you through until the event date and possibly after, but you know that people have your back. People aren't going to help you if they don't feel a vested interest. And how do you form a vested interest? You get to know people, you talk to them. You establish a sense of team. If your event is fueled by a sense of purpose and ownership, that energy is not only just going to be felt by your team, but your guests too. And if you're working with volunteers, oh my god, you got to make those volunteers feel a part of your team. I try not to use the word volunteer. We like to use the word support, or we like to use the words, you know, join the team, be a part of the team, because a volunteer feels like, you know, you're asking something of someone. You're asking somebody to give them your time, and you're not recognizing that you're giving something back to them. You're giving them an experience to walk away with, and if you make it a really good one, they're going to want to come help you again. Uh, okay, so it's your role as the team lead to designate your um, team with certain items, and this is going to be built out in your critical paths. If it's a smaller event and you are planning it alone, please make sure to compartmentalize the tasks so you're not stressing yourself out there is nothing worse than coming to an event just already a stressed ball of wreckage. Um, if something even tiny happens, then you won't be able to deal with it as effectively as you can if you're calm and you know that you set yourself up for success. And remember that the people on your team are not only working with you, they're working with each other too. And it's your role to facilitate that. So if if it means you know, setting up a coffee chat for the volunteer coordinator and the logistics coordinator to get to know each other and start planning out their action items, great. Or maybe it's getting two people to go grocery shopping on the same day. Those little acts build trust. And again, that is pinnacle to creating a sense of team. OK, so I keep saying critical paths. What the hell is this thing, right? So a critical path is a breakdown of your event's components with specific deadlines including uh, dead, um, finances and tasks, as well as where you're going to get them. Basically, you're planning the nuts and bolts of your event. So as I said, this is a resource I'll be giving you, um, and you can use it to mold to your own event. If you're warm, feel free to open up the window. So when you're building out a critical path, you want to be thorough. So for example, let's say one part of your critical path is making sure that there's refreshments for your event. 
Okay, what does that mean? Someone has to go get food. You have to know what you're getting. You have to know how much you're spending. You have to know how far the grocery store is away from your venue if you have to do it on the day up. Is there a fridge? Are there platters? What are you gonna make? All of these things should be included in your critical paths because if you put something like get food or have food, that's so vague, your brain's not going to be able to process that and you're not going to be able to do it and that's when things uh, scramble and you feel rushed. No one likes to feel rushed. And that leads me to the next one, which is be actionable. You want to have actionable tasks with due dates so that people can be accountable to the things that they're doing. So again, think of what it would take to make an event go live. This is a very vague buzzword for a planner. Make it go live. What does that entail? You need to have an event description, you need to have a graphic, you need to have stuff to back up your live event. If I see an event, I want to know, where's the poster? Or can I Google map it? Where's the venue? If you go to a restaurant's homepage, you want to see their menu. These are all of the components that you need to make it live, so be actionable. Be empowering. As I said, this is all about your team. And it is your job to make sure that they feel a part of that. So communicate your final goal to them. For example, okay, let's have five platters with vegetables and fruits for your event. There is the final goal. See how they get there. Maybe they're creating the platter themselves. Maybe they're buying it. See how they get there and make yourself available for frequent check-ins. But empower that person so it doesn't feel like, oh, okay, I'm receiving orders from you and then I'm going to go carry them out. You're giving them a task and you're enabling them to do it themselves and problem solve. And this is very empowering for people. Now, this might seem overwhelming. I'm saying break down everything into 8 million little tasks so you get it done. There are tools for that. Wonderlist, for example, is an excellent free online platform that we use in our offices to help spread tasks around to our volunteers, to our managers, to our team um, coordinators. If you're like me, you might feel that online um, or just project task management tools in general are a hindrance to your projects, um, but you never know until you try. So try it out. There's so many out there. Streak for Google gives you reminders for when to send emails. Just, you know, there's so many uh, different tech platforms out there. I tend to use a lot of just Google Drive um, and Prezi. <laughs> now the last thing you need to remember is that you have to be accountable too. It is not only your team's job to get everything done. You need to make sure you're checking in and enabling them to get it done. So you want to make sure that the foundation on which you base your story is strong. And this is why I'm spending so much time on the first part of the story mountain. Trust me, it's not going to be this in depth for the rest of um, the story process, but the initial planning process, which can take you know three days to three weeks, is the most important because everything else you do after that is going to depend on it. Okay, <coughs> finally at element two, which is rising action, and these are the events leading up to your event. It involves constant checking in with your critical paths and your team. So say you're overseeing your team, things are going smoothly, you're confident that you've thought of everything that Morgan might want when they come to your event. Now what? Remember that an event is not just that stuff that happens on the day of your event. You need to steward the shit out of your event. You need to stay at the top of people's minds. If you tell me two months ago that you're holding a great party, then two months later, I'm not going to remember that. So you have to remind me a month in maybe two weeks in, maybe the day before. Constant updates. Of course, you don't want to overwhelm your, um, your people. Okay, so, at CSI, we like to capture the imagination of people who are coming to our events. That is so vague. How do you capture people's imagination? Now, the content of marketing is so basic. It seems laughable how straightforward it is. You have an event listing, maybe a Facebook page, a couple tweets, a couple posters, that's your marketing. But what about the energy that drives that stuff forward? How often do you read an event post and you're like, I don't want to go to this. Another talk. Even though it might be an interesting topic that you're into, reading the event listing and having it bore you can ruin it from the beginning and maybe hinder you from coming. When we hosted our Turnout Toronto event, 
we captured the imagination of people all around the city by saying, what would happen if we were such a damn engaged city that we became a city of mayors? Is that image in your mind right now, a city of mayors? When I hosted a storytelling event for immigration, we didn't have a storytelling event. We got together to, build, to bring down the walls between cultures together by sharing personal stories of struggle, triumph, and vulnerability, not just a storytelling event. You have to have the vision permeate through everything that you do. So there are three essential components to the messaging that you send out to your public. Consistency, clarity, creativity. We talked a bit about consistency already, but you should also make sure that people know what to expect. This is why clear messaging is so clear. Don't stray too far from your core messaging and be simple. I meet with dozens of people a week and they're excited and I get it too, I'm excited too. Oh, we're gonna have this great event, we're gonna start off with some networking, we're gonna go right into a panel, then there's some breakouts, then there's an auction, then there's this. Okay, what are you trying to do? Does the auction help what you're doing? Does the breakout? Everything needs to have intentionality behind it. You don't do anything for yourself unless there's a good reason to. So think about that when you're asking hundreds of people or dozens of people or two people to come out for you. You can also be consistent in the types of events you're holding and Creative Mornings does this really well. So Creative Mornings is a breakfast lecture series and I know that if I sign up, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get a free coffee, I'm gonna get a free muffin, we're gonna sit down on time, we're gonna have a Q and A and then we're gonna leave. No matter who is speaking, no matter where this event is, I know if I'm going to Creative Mornings, that's what I'm getting. Consistency. People like that. People don't like the name. Sometimes they like the name. But people are scared. So give them what they, what they are expecting. And then a little twist so that you provide something that they're not expecting. So again, constant promotion. When I had a pop-up market, we had 30 vendors. They consisted of entrepreneurs, social enterprises, artists, entrepreneurs. How did I promote it? I announced a new vendor every day to the Facebook page. By the end, I had like 700 people coming. And I didn't do any kind of active marketing. I'm one person. I posted it to Blog2Go, I posted it to Torontoist, and I just let the forces that be have it. But the reason people were so interested was every day they were getting a notification. Oh, this Aaron person posted another thing. Oh, but it's Chocolate Soul. They look really cool. I'm going to go to this event. Consistency. You also have consistent promotion. So if you're looking for a bunch of people to tweet for you, don't ask them, hey, can you tweet for me? Write some tweets, give them to them, and then get them to tweet for you. People will do things more likely if you remove steps for them. Do you ever fill out long forms? I don't. Okay. Clarity. Clarity is also key. You need to be clear with your intent. You need to be clear with what they're going to get when they come. And you also have to be clear with your messaging. No one is going to read a block of text like this. If I get an email from this, I don't care who it's from, I archive it. It is just no. <laughs> so you want to break it up into smaller paragraphs. You want to bold important parts. You want to put the vision at the top. So I'm hooked and I want to keep reading about your event. You want to keep it short. We're in this life now where 140 characters or you know, swipe top down, I don't know, swipe wherever. You need, to, you, need to re, you need to realize that that's the kind of life we're living in and no one wants to sit there and read eight long emails like this. And finally, creativity. This is so key. Now, even in a small workshop, you can be creative in how you present it, uh, promote it, you can even be creative with how you're crafting your messaging to get out to your, um, to your guests. Just do something that would make you smile. Being creative doesn't necessarily mean, you know, having a busker or thinking of some new way to serve melons. It just means doing something that's going to bring joy to someone. And whether that's an unexpected pop of color or a strawberry in a weird place like on a mango mousse, just do something that would make you smile. When we were planning the holiday party, for last year's event. Actually, this holiday party at CSI is an institution, and every year we have a cocktail competition where teams from all of our four different offices, three in Toronto, one in New York, compete with each other for the best cocktail. It's called the Cocktail Smackdown. 
Okay, that's a pretty creative thing, but let's assume every event has some kind of creative thing. Now, we could have just said, hey guys, we're having a cocktail competition, here's the sign up, here's a poster. But what CSI does is every year, the staff get together from all of our locations, even New York, and they make a smack talk video to stoke the fires. So I'm actually gonna show you this video. they don't know. This sets a tone for the event. And it doesn't, as I said, you don't have to be that creative. You know, you don't have to put together a whole Smack Talk video. But, you know, you can see how that would stoke the fires. What's, and really what's Smack Talk? What is that? So it's like, ah, oh, you're going down. <laughs> smack Talk. Oh, okay. Trash Talk. Trash Talk. Yeah. You're too nice. <laughs> 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 jumbled mess, you're not going to enjoy yourself. And this event is as much for you as it is for the people that you're hosting it for. So how do we manage our stress and anxiety? Our brains can trick us into an entire negative spiral by having one small negative thought. One, if you think, oh shoot, I don't think I got the glasses to get delivered for tomorrow. That one thought will spiral and you will now question whether you ordered alcohol, whether you got bartenders, you will be lying in your bed with images of contracts and deposits swirling in your head. It is not going to be a fun experience. I'm going to give you a couple of my tips for making sure that when you come to an event, you can have fun. And not only that, but be in the positive mindset. So if something does come up and you didn't expect it, 
you're in the best possible mindset to handle it. No one problem solves well if they're already under stress. So the first thing is to stay on top of your critical paths. And now you can see why I spent so much time giving you small weird examples of how to build out a critical path because it's so key. And you need to make sure you can check things off physically. You need to see that that shit is done. Otherwise, you're gonna be wondering. Research shows that the simple act of a physical indicator that you achieved a task not only boosts positive hormones in your brain, but it also helps you form positive habits quicker. Double whammy. And you have to trust yourself. You need to trust not only that you have done everything in your power to have this successful event, but also trust that you will be able to respond to new weird challenges if they come up. Trust yourself and your team. Now again, you can see why I put so much emphasis on teamwork and making sure that you're designating and stewarding that because it all comes down to this. And when it's two days to your event and you don't have the eight hours you thought you did tomorrow to prep for it, you know that you're good. You've got this. Now it's event day. Oh my God. You've thought of everything. You've thought about food and facilitation and water and bathrooms and coat racks. You're done. No, you're not done. You need to keep an eye on things during your event. You need to, you know, Practice having chameleon eyes, looking this way at the door to make sure that people are coming in, people are greeted, blah, blah, blah. And then another eye here to make sure that people are talking, is the bar open, etc. Keep an eye on things. Now for free events, you can expect a 30 to 50% attrition rate. On Meetup, I think we were at 63 people attending. About half of you showed up. That's great. For a free event, 30 to 50% attrition rate. Now if you have a paid event, this changes drastically. People have committed. Even if it's $5, people will come. Morgan does not want to waste that money. <laughs> Morgan does not want to waste that money. Now, a free event, maybe it's 5 o'clock and Morgan just finished work. Morgan just finished work. Morgan is hungry. Morgan is tired. Your event's at 6 and it's across town. Morgan's probably going home to Netflix. Morgan paid $5. Oh, Morgan is going to make it to your <laughs> event. They will grab a burrito. <coughs> they are coming. Five bucks. You put value on something. Now, if you don't want to charge for your event, maybe you can be creative with it. This is something that we do. Um, we have a networking event, it's called Six Degrees. We had this idea, hey, we have no idea how many of the 250 people who registered are going to come. What do we do about this? So we started charging people $6 to come, but then they got a free drink. So we're not actually charging them anything because $6 is how much a drink costs. But they're coming because they paid, and they're getting the perceived free drink. So if you want to guarantee people show up, even if it's a five person workshop, put a small cost on it. Give them some clementines. They'll be so happy. Um, here. Also, maybe try to memorize the presentation <coughs> so you're not standing up here with 30 notes. Okay, so. Now, event listings and platforms can help you do some analysis on your events. And most event platforms like Eventbrite and Universe have the option to check people in at the door. You can do analytics right through the um, platform. You can download an app so you can check people in. It looks super cool. You look super modern. Um, and most of these things also have tools that help you see, OK, who came? How many people came of the people that who registered? How many people who came from the people who registered were VIP guests? how many of them have never come to this event before. Most of these platforms allow you to customize the information that you're getting from people when they sign up so that you can plan for the future. And this is so important if it's a strategic event. If you're trying to get fundraisers or partners, are the people who are coming to your event just people who want to know what's going on or are they actually interested in making an investment? It is so key to know who is coming to your events. Uh, oh, don't forget though, the more information, <coughs> bless you, that you ask for in a form, the less people will, will sign up. The longer the form, the smaller the intake. No one wants to sit there and fill out when, you know, when they last made an investment to TD. They want to sit there and put their name, their email, and maybe one or two other questions. So really think about what you want to know about your guests. <coughs> Now, facilitation.
facilitation and hosting. Somebody already came up to me before the event to talk about facilitation, and I could talk about icebreakers and improv games and facilitation for hours. So if you're interested in that, let's talk after this session. Now, your emotional intelligence when you're hosting or facilitating is just as important as your managerial and your organizational intelligence. When you enter a room, learn to read it. Do the people seem like they know each other or does it seem like they don't? Are they interacting? Do they need an icebreaker? Maybe they do. But what if your event doesn't need an icebreaker? Think about the context. Think about what you would want to do if you were sitting here and try to cater that. We love to do creative facilitation at CSI. This is a connector game. This is Morgan enjoying the connector game. And, um, and this is our facilitator, our director of culture. Now, I love bringing this kind of strange, get up, I've never done this before kind of facilitation. Let's say if you're hosting a corporate visioning session or an off-site retreat for a branch of the government. You want to do things that people aren't expecting, but expecting. And it's a really fine balance that you're walking, but it all comes back to considering the Morgan and what Morgan would want. Uh, we've actually taken to getting people to write things down as a great facilitation. So my organization needs, I am awesome at. That lets you do a give and take with people you're meeting. Oh, I see you're looking for a marketing consultant. I am a professional marketer but I really could use some advice on my artistic development and I see that you are the creative director. It encourages conversation. And this doesn't need fancy stickers. You can do this on masking tape. Okay. In our last staff meeting, we actually had improv. And we had two hours of improv after we did our staff check-ins. And we did this to exercise different skills and to get to know each other on levels that we didn't know before. So we meet as a staff team once a month. We have 40 plus people on our team. A check-in where each person says one thing about themselves takes over an hour. This is every month, and then we have high-level updates, and we have a State of the Union, and etc. We have our check-ins, and then our, our facilitator threw this at us. Hey, you guys are going to be doing improv for two hours now. Now, I've been doing improv for a year with the person who came to facilitate, so it was a real treat, but it was so great watching my colleagues squirm and do something that they were uncomfortable with. Oh. And you know what, though? You might be uncomfortable in the moment, but when you leave, you're going to be surprised with yourself and happy. And think about that with your guests, too. <sighs> okay. Now, the falling action. The cleanup. Considering your character also means considering yourself and your team as the event plays out. Who's cleaning up? If you know that you're going to be schmoozing with your guest speaker, maybe you need to assign someone else to pack up the microphone. Think about the character. Think about your team. Bring yourself back into the present. Don't stay up here. This stuff should be outlined in your critical paths already, so it's not extra work. You'll just be making sure that things are getting done and stewarding the event as you go. And never underestimate the time that it takes to clear up after an event. When I'm working with a client and they say, oh, yeah, we just need half an hour to clean up. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. You need minimum an hour. This cleanup will take more than half an hour. This is a 30-person workshop. Now, this is, these are people who are coming into our venue to host a social, and they think they need 30 minutes to clean up. They're not thinking about themselves and their team. They're not thinking about the Morgan who wants to stay after the event officially ends to schmooze with a couple people that he met and wants to pursue a business idea with. This is the stuff that happens at your event, and you need to facilitate that. And that starts from the planning process. Now, if the tone allows, you can organize for a final sort of feedback activity. And this is something that we love to do. So we love to post <coughs> questions on blackboards and chalkboards. So this is from our Turnout Toronto event. And it says, Toronto, in 2014, I'm going to dot, dot, dot. And then all these people fill this in. And it's a great way for you to not only have a cool image for your presentation six months later, but also read it and be like, oh, these are the things that the people who came to my event are thinking about and want to do. Maybe the next time I host this, I should look back at this photo. A lot of people pointed out food. Maybe we should do a food-themed talk. These are the kind of things that you can get from the people who are coming to your event. Don't ignore that. I also have a ritual with one of my colleagues where we bike home together after an event's done, and we talk about it. We talk about the things that went well, and we talk about the things that didn't go so well. And we plan for the next one. 
And not only are you reflecting and possibly working while you're biking home, but you're also decompressing and you're sharing. When I'm finished an event, I'm very riled up and I just want to talk about it. Oh, I, you know, not as many people came as I thought they would. And once you get that out, it's not in your brain when you're falling asleep later. Get that stuff out, even if it's writing it down so that future you can look at it later. And don't forget to take mental notes or even physical notes throughout your event. Today, on my way, um, I walked over here from our other office. It's about a 50 minute walk away. And as soon as I came in, I had like three ideas in my head about this presentation, and I needed to get them down. And as soon as I walked through the door, someone said, oh, hey, Aaron. And I said, wait, give me a pen. I need to get this out. And I wrote it down. And we had a two minute conversation. And sure enough, after that conversation, I couldn't remember what I wrote down, but I wrote it down. It's so key. Now, after the wrap up comes the end. And the end of your event does not mean the end of your work. It's the denouement that means the resolution. You're reflecting on what happened. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about storytelling is because it encourages a culture of reflection in a time that we don't really get that in our daily lives. This photo is from a storytelling event I hosted just this last Saturday with four other friends. Basically, six people get up in front of a room and share incredibly personal stories with each other in a friend's living room. Stepping back and telling those kinds of stories allows you to get a fuller idea of who you are. But stepping back after an event gives you a fuller idea of who you are as an organization, or as an advocacy group, or as an entrepreneur, as a service provider. You need to reflect on the work that you're doing. If a lot of writers and editors came out to your human rights conference, maybe your organization needs to cast a wider net and target those people because they're clearly interested in your work. Maybe you didn't get as many marketing consultants out. That's critical information for the work that you're doing. <coughs> Reflecting also helps you plan for the events ahead. And the third resource I'll be giving you today is called an exit report. Now an exit report can be a really important resource to your team and to your organization, especially if there are different people leading events all the time. I work with many nonprofits and most of the event planners I work with are not event planners by trade. I'm not an event planner by trade. We pick things up as we go. This is the way that our careers are unfolding now. You learn skill sets and you apply them to certain jobs. So an event planner today is not an event planner tomorrow. So I'm working with people who are on contract planning events and don't know where to start. If your organization has an exit report and is like, hey, you're new on contract, please plan this annual event. Here is a whole stack of thoughts and reflections from three years so you know how to plan this event. Super key. So now it's time to consider one more character, and that's future you, whether you're a man or a woman. So this is my future me, and her name is Janine. So, <laughs> it's okay, future me, Janine. Janine will handle it, that's what I always say. So, um, where does Janine come in here? Of course, after an event, like I said, you're going to need to decompress and reflect, and maybe you don't want to start writing out an exit report the day after your event. I sure as hell don't. I usually take about a week, get back in stride, think about things, and then I start building out an exit report. Um, and you want to include things, not only like the hard facts, but also, oh my god, we ran out of food in the first 10 minutes, or we didn't have enough hands to support, anything that will help you plan later. So after planning the CSI holiday party in 2013, this is the year that I joined CSI full time. And this was my first time organizing a holiday party for 400 people. First time. I was petrified. Now, it all went smoothly. I had a great team. I had a great mentor. It was all great. And afterwards, I developed an exit report to not only help me debrief, but also plan the next year and plan similarly large events because I was working with like eight different people and you need a tool to help you manage that. So, after planning that party, I made an exit report so Janine would be like, yes, I have all of this information to plan this event. And when I planned our 2014 event, I barely broke a sweat. Unlike right now, where I am sweating profusely. So I could look back at the exit report and know how many bottles of liquor I bought, and how much it cost, and from which LCBO, and who drove me. I knew that I needed to spend a lot more money on getting pizza and to get mix, and I didn't get ice. And it's also a great opportunity after you build out this exit report to get feedback from your, uh, from your team. 
So I normally just use a Google Doc, and I'll build out the report, you'll see the template, and then I share it with my team, and I say, hey guys, comment away. And they comment, and we have this great collaborative, open source resource for whoever is planning the next event. And you can also, in that document, collect testimonials from people who attended. And that is so important if you're promoting your event next time. If you can quote someone saying these things, then, oh my god, people are going to flock to you. Can someone laugh at my puns? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I wrote them they look Thank like you. fish from this angle, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud of these puns, so I really wanted to just call them out. <laughs> this is a sign. Got it. <laughs> so, decompressing and reflecting can take a variable amount of time. And after our Turnout Toronto event, which was a civic engagement fair, we invited a bunch of people to come talk about their work, community organizations, nonprofits, counselors. Four weeks after this event, I was still swimming with thoughts, and I did not make an exit report. Actually, I should slap myself on the wrist. I never made an exit report for Turnout Toronto. There's just too much going on, but you should. So four weeks later, I'm still reflecting on this event. And one thing that someone said to me stuck out, and it was, you guys brought together what took me three years to find in the city into one room. I thought, wow, that is huge. Huge, three years of work I can give to someone in four hours? Sign me up, we need to do more. And when we met as a team to debrief after, we realized that we couldn't do more. All of our plates were full. We had no capacity to do this. So we, we talked about it, we reflected it, but we knew that we wanted to scale the idea. So when one person contacted one of the four of the people who organized Turnout Toronto, that one person knew that they could come to the three of us and be like, hey, Toronto Public Library wants to duplicate our event. And I know you guys are down for that. So let's make it happen. So what did we do? We developed the resources to hand off to someone else, and they carried on the event for us. The importance in that is, and especially in the whole exit report reflection process, is that you never should forget what you're working towards. Every decision you make should underline your vision. Never stop thinking about how you can evolve your organization's work or your passion. Never stop realizing that you can grow your tool set every week if you wanted to. Okay, so now we're back to this idea. Events tell your story. We climbed Story Mountain together. This gargantuan beast, we did it, so we're on the other side. I'm going to equip you with three templates, the event design, the critical paths, and the exit report, so you can start applying this to your events. And hopefully afterwards, some of you want to chat about some other tips if you need them. I tried to be very high level, so excuse me for not going into real you know, details of one type of event. But if you're working in a nonprofit or a social enterprise or you're a social entrepreneur, like so many of the people that I'm contacting every day, then that means you're passionate about something. And this is way more important than what your role is currently or what work you're doing right now or the fact that you're planning an event. The fact that you're passionate about something means that you have something to put into the world. So are you organizing a, a visioning retreat or are you standing up to the challenge of homelessness in Toronto? Are you organizing a conference or are you trying to rally people together to change the rural school system? You're not just holding an event, you're fighting for a cause. And whether that cause is something as small as, hey, I'm gonna teach these five people that mindfulness is actually super key to leadership, that's still making a difference. It doesn't have to be impacting policy or in, you know, changing a world issue. It can be as small as that, but as long as you are passionate about it and that's what you want to relay, then it's going to be so strong. Just remember that events are bringing together people, but for a purpose. And in many cases, it's a shared purpose if everyone's coming out to one event. <clears throat> Few things hold as much power and potential as people together with shared purpose. So make your guests know this, make sure your team knows this, and make people aware of the power of collective action. <coughs> you need to tell your stories to make change happen, and events are the, one of the most active and visible ways that you can do this. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I came to get water. Now I will answer questions. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> what email tools?
tools do you like using? Yes, so Streak is a really good one. I think I mentioned it. There's a free trial available, and then there's um, some paid levels. Um, I tried using Streak for a while, and uh, I will be very upfront with you all that I usually choose not to use technology. Probably not the best thing to say at a Toronto Net Tuesdays event for TechSoup Canada. Um, but Streak has been great because it gives you reminders, you can schedule emails. Um, I'm a big believer in my Google Calendar, honestly, like the tasks. Um, you can set a task as an all day thing and then check it off. And so every day I know that all of my tasks are checked and then I can go and I don't have to think about it. So that's a really good one. Um, and, and then, sorry, and then for inputting, yes. like, let's say you wanted to send out an email to 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the easiest way to input those 5,000 names? Uh, so um, we use MailChimp at CSI, and if you like, I can, of course, connect you to people who are communications leads. Uh -huh. um, but MailChimp is a really great tool for being able to tailor messaging and schedule it. And, and then what's, then what's Streak? What's the difference between MailChimp and Streak? Streak is an app that goes into your Gmail <coughs> account. Okay. And um, whereas MailChimp is an app that's actually it's owned by Google, correct? No? no. No. Oh, it's just a, a Google app that's available. Uh, so it, it works with Google Drive, so you uh, can install it and attach it, so you can see it in your dash if you'd like to. Yes, but gotcha. it's not a Google product. Okay, so MailChimp is just a separate platform then, uh -huh. where you can input emails and it'll, it'll keep a database of all of those, and you can set campaigns and all of that. Right, and then what's the what's Streak? I don't, so what's the difference between the two? Um, streak more just embeds into your actual email, so if you're sending an email, Streak will record that, and it kind of builds an internal CRM into your inbox. Think of it this way, MailChimp is the product, and Streak is the shipping uh, label that you track. Think of it that way. If you order something online, you'll uh, you'll get your product that you ordered from Amazon, and on the outside will be the manifest, right? Uh -huh. Streak is the manifest. It lets you know it was sent, that it was received, who it was sent to, why it was sent, mm -hmm. any info that's required, but it itself is not your email or your message. Okay, thank you. If you don't use these, what do you use? Um, a lot of Google Drive, and I like to develop my own sort of systems um, to, to accomplish tasks, and this is the, the templates that I've built out for you, and those are honestly the things that I use the most often. Um, so CSI plans at least one event a month, and then uh, in our venues we have about 20 to 30 events a month. And uh, for me, any tool having to input that stuff is just, it seems overwhelming, so I tend to just um, use tracking documents and good old pen and paper. So I work for the children, and you talked about attrition being about 30 to 50%. Yeah. So do you have any tips on how to lower the attrition mm -hmm. if you don't do attrition fees? I know it's hard to get adults, but it's even harder to get children mm -hmm. now. So. Mm -hmm. so the question here was, um, for a, an event that is free, that do not does not want to charge, how can we lower the attrition rate for people who are saying that they're going to come but not actually going to come? And that's a tricky beast for everyone. So I'm just going to share with you some of the things that I've learned to be helpful. And um, hopefully the things in my presentation sort of feel that because it's that whole instilling a vision piece. Like if I know that I need to be there because it's something I care about, then I'm going to go. Or if I know that there's a really cool attractor, like a really um, influential person in the field, or someone who's out of Canada and I'm never going to see them speak again, then I'm going to go. Um, it's really good to be specific about what people are going to get. If you tell me, hey, come to Free the Children Social, I might not go. But if you tell me, come to Free the Children Social, where we will not only meet other people and funders, but you'll have an opportunity to network with these, these, these kind of people, then maybe I'll come. So it's all about the specifics and communicating why Morgan should be there. Why should Morgan come? And um, it's tough, and that's why there's such a high attrition rate for um, free events, but, and especially in a saturated city like Toronto, I mean, in any given night, there's 80 things going on, so, you know, it's also the nature of the beast that we live in, but if you are able to put an image into someone's mind as to why they absolutely cannot miss this, then they'll probably come. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Uh, not a question, sure. but I received a magazine in the, in the mail this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, 
about an hour before I was here, and it's titled Eight New Tech Tools for Events. Ah, so I'm going, to, uh, All right. Right. I'm going to leave this with the powers that be. Oh, beautiful. And they will, I assume, distribute it. Yeah. The, okay. Lovely. Thank you, Wes. Erin, we had a question from the live stream. Yes. Uh, Lori would like to know what online uh, event planning registration and payment platform do you ah. suggest, so, like uh, Eventbrite yes. or Steven? Yes. Ideally, she'd like something that works tandem with PayPal. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you, Lori. Um, so we have a live stream going on and we're taking some questions. Uh, so event platforms, tried and true Eventbrite. I, I, I really love Universe too. Universe is a really great local Toronto-based event platform. They have a bit of a lower rate for paid events for nonprofits, excuse me, as well as just in general from the competitors. Um, it is a little bit less customizable, and because they're so new and local, uh, not as robust as Eventbrite might be. But if you're looking for a cheaper option, Universe is really great. Universe also actually has algorithms that tap into social networks. So if I attend an event on Universe, then it will tell other Universe users um, what's trending. It'll send out a weekly email that sends out just trending um, events. And uh, it's a really great way to have some social reach. Um, we've also experimented with things like Splash That, uh, Cvent, and to be honest, they're, they're really beautiful interfaces, but we always go back to the Eventbrite purely for functionality. We know what we're getting when we use it. It's consistent, it's clear, and um, you know you get really anal uh, good analytics from it. Um, the payment process is pretty streamlined. It's, it's integrated with PayPal, so we use Eventbrite quite a bit. <coughs> Now, these, these sessions are driven by Meta. I don't know if anybody has any comments on Meta. Yes. One of the things that uh, some of the fundraising groups mentioned about Meta is that it's really that it's, it also tells you who's going to be there. Yes. And that kind of that social piece that mm -hmm. if you know people are going to be there, then you're much more likely to show up. Absolutely. So, yes. Oh, sorry, just to add on, and another interesting thing about that we noticed just uh, this week uh, Meta periodically removes Stormit users. So if you don't log in for a period of time or you don't do anything for a period of time, <coughs> Meetup will remove you because the last time we went to look uh, after the break, we said, oh, that number looks a lot lower than it used to be. Uh, and that's partly why. Like, it's, it's not a, I don't think it's anything permanent. Like, we haven't banned you or anything like that, but which is like to your attrition question. So if you, you know, if you mm -hmm. consistently just click, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go, but you don't ever log in and go, they will kind of take you out, which is right. kind of cool. Like Absolutely. That. And you also want to consider the type of event platform that you're using. So if it's a paid event, then you probably want something like Eventbrite or Universe to help you with the whole ticketing process. But if it's a free event, then there's a number of different options, and especially if it's a huge dropping kind of event, you don't want, if I'm attending a festival, I don't want to sign up for it, I just want to go. And if I want you to know I'm going to go, then the extent of it is probably just going to be me attending on Facebook. So think about that too, think about your audience. And know your strengths. If you don't know how to tweet well, I don't know how to tweet well. If you look at my Twitter wall, it's, it's atrocious. But get people who do. Don't sacrifice your pride on delivering excellence. Surround yourself with people who can pick up the slack on things that you know you can't do well and get it done. So, yeah. Did you have another question? Oh, okay. Anybody, yes. oh. any comments on using Facebook events for uh, capturing who's coming? It's quick and dirty. It's, it's, it's not committal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of new. I, w I will agree in saying that Facebook is very non-committal. Um, it is really great in the sense that um, it's visual. It's like a nice meetup. It's visual. It's, yeah. It's like you, you actually it might trigger. What happens is you're going through your feed that day, and a friend mm -hmm. of yours is going to an event. Exactly. And it'll trigger you to attend that event. Exactly. And so it's like it's sort of an idea generator. Yes. If you're saying, "Oh my God, I do this Saturday. Oh, there's an open house at the Waldorf School." Yes. You know? Yes, absolutely. This yeah. is so key. So our immigration storytelling event, I only had about 100 people attending on Facebook. Not a big deal. It's all good. I didn't do any kind of crazy marketing. But then a woman from Metro Morning called me and asked me to That's be on the I radio. Okay. How did she find out? She found out because her friend's cousin clicked attending on Facebook and I got on CBC for it. Like, think about that stuff. Think about the ripple effects from the things that you're doing. And this is so key too in the, in the sense of engaging new people. 
this event is not only the people who showed up right now and the people who are looking on live stream, it's the people who saw it and said, oh shoot, I want to go, but I can't, and now know that I deliver event management workshops. You know, so think about those ripple effects. Yeah, thank you for your comment. And you had a question. Yeah, I was just, uh, I, was, I mean, I was here to learn about the different tools, but uh, I'm also from uh, Canada Helps, and we are launching an event uh, ticket sales tool here this summer. Oh, great. It's for charities. So you can speak to him about that. It's <laughs> called Canada Meets? Uh, Canada Helps. No, but is the tool called Canada Meets? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we can tell. Canada Helps? Yeah. Yes, Maria. Um, I'm doing some event planning for the federal election coming up. What are some creative things that you can do at the parties? Yeah, so are you like Politics. facilitation or like more like just things for people to passively um, I'm trying to make it fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, simplicity is so key. It's really easy to get up in our heads about what's fun. And, and appropriate. And appropriate, yeah. 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 And so I bring this back again to think about what you would want. So if you are used to a stuffy sort of, you know, government election atmosphere, what would you want? You don't want to go to just another corporate shindig. You want something that kind of shakes you up a little. So is that a DJ who's playing swing music? Or is that a really interesting food display? People go crazy over food. If you put food next to another food with a toothpick in it, like people go insane. People love that. And food is like one of those things that people Instagram the most often and talk about like, oh yeah, I went to this event, the food was fantastic. Or the food was really crappy. So you can be really <laughs> creative with food. Make a tower with fruit, like have a dessert fondue okay. thing, you know? Like food, music, like those things that you can be a little bit wa wacky with. Those are the easiest things to be creative with. Yes? This sounds ridiculous, but you know the things that in sharing, doing events, mm -hmm. the things that stay with you, but then you remember mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my god, I've got to make sure I think of this. And a lot of times, you can spend so much time and energy and money on all the things that you think are so important. Absolutely. And a friend of ours used to run events at Rotman, and she would always say the only thing people complained about mm -hmm. or they seemed focused on was the cookies. <laughs> And every other time we go to something and then everybody would be like, oh my god, look at the cookies they yeah. have here. And she'd yeah. say, I had better have like an outstanding chocolate chip cookie. Absolutely. They're good complaining about the cookies. Or no yeah. cookies. No. Or, or no, no cookies, cookies. yeah. It's just it's like, like your whole event Herbal is tea. reduced to nothing because they were disappointed in your cookie. Yeah. Okay. Chairs and cheese. Yep. So, I mean, cheese means all food and chairs means all suitable surfaces, but chairs <laughs> and cheese. You know, um, when I think of the things, and this is again bringing it back to your character, right? The things I love most, probably in order, are pizza, my bed, and maybe water. Those are probably like the top three things. Two of those are edible. You know, like food is always at the top of your mind. When you're hungry, you're at your worst. When you have a cookie, you're at your best. <laughs> Uh, are there any other questions from the crowd? Yes. I think along the lines of creativity. Mm -hmm. So I work with an association um, of people who are like system administrators and like our application support and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There, I, in promoting, you talked about using creativity, mm -hmm. and I'm always really hesitant. Like how I'm always really professional. I don't want to mm -hmm. go too far. I don't want to offend anybody. Like yeah. how do how do you be creative yet not, and how far can you go? Yeah, that? absolutely, and it's hard to ride that line, especially um, coming from CSI, our workplace culture, as you can see, is very, you know, different. Um, and so this impacts how I send emails and how I interact with people and how I address. Now, if you're in a more professional atmosphere, um, you know, consider whether the invitations that you're sending out are physical or via email. Now, if they're physical, I've seen such creative things. Somebody needed their crowdfunding campaign uh, to raise money, and they were closing in on their due date. And so they walked around the office with a plate of mini cupcakes, and you could only get a cupcake if you signed their uh, support wall. So like, or you can, um, you know, there's really neat ways to fold invites and stuff like that. Uh, we like to put information on the back of a photo, so we have waffle breakfasts to encourage our members to meet each other, and we like to put the info on the back of a printed waffle. Now, if it's not a print invitation that you can be creative with, um, like I said, you can even be creative with how you message things or how or your word choices. If you're always saying, um, please attend this evening of etc., then what word will jump out at them? Please attend this symposium or 
visioning retreat or whatever. Whatever they're not used to, give it to them. If they're not used to ever having something of color in their email, make one word pop out with color. You know, I don't think that necessarily overrides professionalism. I think that's small enough that um, it will be okay, but it will still be engaging and different enough that people at least notice it. And then you can start pushing the boundaries of what you can do to actually get them to count. So, yes. experiments. I heard, yes. Last question? Sure. I don't know. Last question? We have six minutes. We have six minutes. Why aren't there any cookies? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Word cookies. Yeah, like I need In the <laughs> yeah. 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 I love you, I thought, less. Lemon is less than screen. Okay, yes. What's um, um an easy way, or you can find the best way to make money on an event? Like, I know that's a whole fundraising question, but I'm just saying so money at the door, or quick raffle, or pass the hat. Mm. Just like small money. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. What do you think? That's a great idea. All right, great question. Um, so, again, if it were me, I would be less likely to, you know, put something in a donation bucket if it's going around, or um, pay at the door, as uh, compared to if you have a dollar spin the wheel for a prize thing, or a two dollar enter for a chance to win this. Small increments multiple times is a lot more convincing for me anyway, because, and this is, this is the classic thing, my parents used to own a restaurant, and in my head I always thought, why don't we, instead of a restaurant, just pack everything up and sell it to people for three dollars less? And, you know, I mean, the reason was we didn't want a takeout place, but really, the whole thing was, well, $3 less, why $3 less so we can charge $10? Well, I thought, well, won't you sell more if it's cheaper? You know, and that's the thing, like, if, 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 you're, if you have a bunch of toonies that add up to $20, you're going to spend those toonies like this. If you have a 20, you're not going to touch that until you have something really nice to buy. So it's small increments. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. So I'm happy to answer more questions um, offline. Um, and you can also email me, you live streamers. Uh, Jess will give you my email. Um, and on your way out, we have three resources, like I said. We have an event design, which will help you build out what your event is going to be. You can also use this actually to mirror your event listing. They're probably going to be very similar. You're going to have a template for a critical pass that you'll be using to plan and execute your event for the two weeks or two years that you're planning up to it. And the exit report that you will fill out, uh, fill out every time and share so that you can learn from past events, know what to do again, and know what not to do again. Uh, my business cards are also out there. So thank you for coming tonight. And I uh, hope you're helpful. Thank you.